All right, wonderful. Um, so next up, we have Sonata Simonitis Boyd, who has been working this summer with Drew Newman. Sonata joins us from UC San Diego, where she's a rising sophomore, and she'll tell us today about her project, Modeling Galaxy Spectra for Lyman Alpha Tomography. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Thanks so much for the introduction, Gwen. I'm really excited to tell everyone about what I've been working on this summer. So first, oh, let's start with a little bit of background. So. The universe is pervaded with large structures that we call the cosmic web. Now, these are mostly dark matter, but we can use hydrogen gas as a tracer. for this. We can find this hydrogen gas by looking at the spectra of objects behind it. We call these objects background sources. Hydrogen absorbs Lyman alpha photons, and thus hydrogen absorption only shows up in a specific part of the source's spectrum, which is called the Lyman alpha forest. Now, I have a little video here for you. Um, this video traces out the absorption by neutral hydrogen, shown here as it's being plotted, um, from a quasar towards an observer along one line of sight. <clears throat> so as we move along, as the line move, moves along, the, the spectra are being plotted out. Um, the absorption is being um, <clears throat> plotted out along the quasar spectrum. So that's just along one line of sight. Um, if we compile multiple lines of sight, specifically with galaxies rather than quasars as our background sources within a given volume, we're able to make 3D maps of hydrogen distribution in that volume, which in turn traces the dark matter distribution. This is Lyman alpha tomography. The Lyman alpha tomography IMAX survey, or LATIS for short, which is currently underway at Magellan, is the first survey to do this over large volumes. So here I have a figure from a LATIS paper from last year, um, which is an example of 3D maps of hydrogen distribution with the red spots having the most absorption <clears throat> and going down towards uh, least absorption with blue. So how does all this connect to my project though? Well, my project is specifically to improve the modeling of lattice galaxy spectra. Um, my results will either validate or invalidate lattice's ex existing modeling method. And with an improved model, hopefully we'll also have an improved quality of lattice maps. So before I get into it too much, I want to start by breaking down some key parts of a galaxy spectrum and also introducing some terminology that I'll be using throughout the rest of my presentation. So what I have here is just an average spectrum of the lattice data. But here are some important parts. So here in the blue, we have the Lyman alpha forest. In brown, we have the Lyman alpha emission line. And in red, we have the spectrum redward of the emission line. <clears throat> the spectrum redward is purely the galaxy's intrinsic spectrum. But the Lyman alpha forest is a mixture of the intrinsic spectrum and hydrogen spectrum. So if we can make a really good model of the intrinsic spectrum, we can divide that out of the observed spectrum and isolate that hydrogen spectrum, which is so important for that Lyman alpha tomography. But how do we know that there's actually a reliable model that we can make? <clears throat> well, as it turns out, a lot of these spectral lines vary together, specifically metal absorption lines. The lines in the magenta spectrum are pretty shallow, but as we go down the spectrum from magenta all the way down to the dark blue, the absorption lines get deeper and they get deeper all throughout each spectrum. What this tells us is that we can use information in one part of the spectrum to predict what information in, to predict what parts, what other parts of the spectrum will look like. For example, we can use the spectrum redward of Lyman alpha to predict the forest. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, onto the project itself. So what I have, what we did to start is we took our 2,627 lattice galaxy spectra and we grouped them in tens according to their similarity as judged by chi-squared metric. This leaves us with 262 stacks or average spectra. What I have here plotted is six random stacks from our 262. Um, <clears throat> we just wanted to get like a qualitative, do a qualitative analysis just to get an idea of um, how much work we have cut out for us. For example, if all these spectra were very similar than that, then we could just use um, an average spectrum, like the one I showed two slides ago, um, as the basis of our model. But because all of these spectra are quite different, they're very distinct, um, that tells us that we need um, a more nuanced method of modeling spectra, something so we can really fit all the unique characteristics of each spectra. Um, and the method that we chose was principal component analysis. Now, principal component analysis is a type of dimensionality reduction. 
In short, we're going from a higher dimension to a lower dimension or expressing the data more simply. As the figure shows, um, <clears throat> the, originally, the data set originally starts in a three-dimensional space, but then it's reduced to a two-dimensional space where rather than describing each data point as, um, <clears throat> as um, three in three-dimensional space, you describe it as a combination of one of the two or, or as a combination of the two principal components, so in two-dimensional space. These components are ordered by how much variation they describe. Um, but what we really want PCA for is this last feature, um, the fact that we can model an individual element of the data set as the mean of the data plus a linear combination of components. But that begs the question, how many components do we actually want? To figure that out, we can start with another qualitative assessment. Plotted here are the first six components, which are all quite distinct. The first six components of our data set, that is. Um, the components that follow aren't, and those are mostly noise. So that kind of gives us a ceiling. We know we don't want more than six components, but do we actually want all six? Well, we want as few components as possible so we make sure we're not modeling noise, but we also want enough components to make sure that we're modeling most of the intrinsic variation. So now we need to model, we need to narrow down the number of components we want. Unfortunately, when we test performance on the same data, we always underestimate the error. So it's useful to evaluate performance on an independent data set. And that's what cross-validation does. With cross-validation, we split up our data set into two parts and use 70% of it to train the PCA in our case, and the remaining 30% to test it. This helps make sure that the PCA isn't learning the noise and thus prevents overfitting. So I have plot here are three figures of the scatter of the residuals in three distinct spectral regions, the Lyman alpha forest, the Lyman alpha emission region, and the spectrum redward of Lyman alpha. To get these figures, uh, to get these plots, we modeled all 262 stacks using components and plotted the error as a function of wavelength for different numbers of components. Now, I want to bring your attention to the rightmost plot, uh, red, redward of Lyman alpha. If we compare the blue spikes um, for zero components to <clears throat> um, the mean spectrum, we notice that the strongest residual spikes are aligned with the strongest absorption spikes in the mean spectrum. What this tells us is that the mean spectrum by itself is not a good model. However, as we add more components, the spikes get smaller and the residuals get reduced. At four components, residuals stop decreasing, which is what we're looking for, where the residuals stop decreasing. <clears throat> in the Lyman alpha emission region, similarly, the residuals stop decreasing at four components as well. However, in the Lyman alpha forest, um, the mean spectrum is almost adequate. There are just a few places um, where we need to add some components. Um, but we find out that actually just one component is adequate to model the Lyman alpha forest. So. Now that we know how many components we want for to model the spectrum redward of Lyman alpha from which the forest will be predicted, we can make our model. So here on the left, <clears throat> I have our a random spectrum and then the model that we fit into that spectrum. <clears throat> Just assessing it qualitatively, we can see that our model actually fits quite well, especially in the Lyman alpha forest. It's a good thing that the model doesn't match the stack perfectly because then if it did, then we'd be fitting a lot of noise, which we really want to avoid. But we also have, um, we can also do a quantitative analysis. What I have here on the right is a plot of the explained variance fraction. Essentially, what this tells us is that if this blue line ever goes above this black dotted line, then that component <clears throat> at that point is plotting noise. So we really wanna stay below that that line, it's our ceiling. As it turns out, um, with four components, 96% of the variance not due to noise is explained by the model. So that's a pretty accurate model. So what this tells us is that our model can accurately model the variation we see in the lattice galaxy spectra. So to wrap it up, <clears throat> we found that one component is enough to explain the variation in the Lyman alpha forest. This is actually pretty similar to the method that Lattice uses. And so we have, um, <clears throat> and so we validated Lattice's method. We've also found that because only one component is necessary for the forest, the forest is simple to model. And this is very useful for Lyman alpha tomography, which really, um, <clears throat> which really want, you really want um, a simple underlying spectrum and simple intrinsic spectrum. <clears throat> 
We've also found that four components are enough for the spectrum redward of Lyman alpha. And outside of Lyman alpha tomography, having an accurate model is useful for measuring galaxy redshifts and detecting metal absorption. Thank you. Very nice job, Sonata. Do we have questions? All right, so I'm curious, Sonata, um, uh, if you thought, you know, so you have these, uh, this one component in the forest that you think uh, is sufficient for, for modeling sort of that region uh, where tomography is, uh, is sort of most critical to tomography. And then you have this other region uh, to the right. I'm curious if you guys talked at all about um, sort of what those PCA components actually mean, if, if there's any, um, if there's anything interesting in, in any of those uh, three components redward of, of the forest, or, or if you were just mostly focused on, on the forest absorption and so you weren't really um, interested in the sort of physical meaning of the different PCA components. Well, the PCA components themselves kind of explain like the variance, um, like from the mean spectrum or another way that I like, or that was easier for me to understand was they kind of explained like, um, or they showed kind of the, some of the most prominent features of the spectra. And so um, that's kind of like how I understood it. But besides that, it was more their application, not as much what they individually really meant. Perfect. All right. Any other questions for Sonata? All right. Wonderful. Thank you.